Foster, longtime Basque member. He's going to talk about his adventures in East Greenland, which I know not many Baskers have paddled. So, um, so I first met Charles when uh, in Morro Bay, one of the weekend yeah. campouts in Morro Bay, and it turned out he was camped right next to me. And I saw, boy, that's a nice kayak he has. He had a has a nice uh, um, composite sea kayak. Um, and we started chatting, and uh, it, it was clear Charles and I shared a love for expeditioning. So um, we had a great time comparing notes on different expeditions we've been on and which ones we're thinking about doing and all kinds of stuff. So, um, and then we've kind of kept in touch just to just to uh, hear about each other's uh, adventures so, so we can experience them vicariously. Um, mm -hmm. But Charles says he's been paddling for more than 50 years, so he must have started when he was about five, I'm guessing. Um, in, uh, he says in watercraft ranging from aluminum canoes to rafts, whitewater, surf, and sea kayaks. So he's uh, spent a lot of time on the water. And uh, he's been to Greenland twice um, and did a six-week trip last summer. So I'm uh, really curious to hear about all the logistics of how you manage six weeks in Greenland. Um, so uh, he's going to talk, share some photos of where he's been and insights. Um, and um, I, it's likely he's going to convince me to go, but maybe he'll convince some of you other folks to, to visit Greenland as well. So Charles, take it away. Thank you. Oh, thank, thanks, Chris. Um, and I, can, can everybody see my title yeah. chart here? Okay, good. I'll just uh, jump into it. Although I, you, I'll point out the, they're mostly my pictures in this presentation collected over over the couple of trips. Um, and I, I went through, it's well over a thousand <laughs> photos I have and video clips and whatnot. So I, I promise you, I won't show you every one and I won't tell you the story, the detailed story behind each of the ones I do show, but try to keep it, I'll try to keep it moving along as best I can. But if, if there's, um, I have room for questions at the end, if something urgent comes up, let, let me know if I'm missing some key point that that you want me to hit. Um, okay, so here, this is one I took last summer, that one of the, the most spectacular uh, icebergs of the, the trip, and I'll launch into it. Okay, just a little bit of introduction. I think everybody's heard of Greenland, and you normally see it all stretched out on a map where it looks bigger than, than all the other continents around it, but it, it is a pretty big chunk of land. It's the, the world's biggest island. Um, you can see from the from Google Earth here, it's almost entirely covered with a, a huge ice cap, but there are areas along the coast, a little bits of green that aren't permanently covered with ice. Everything gets snowed over in the winter and the fjords freeze up, but there are some habitable pieces of, of land. That's really the, the only place that that people live and historically have lived is along these coastlines. Um, let's see, and it's roughly, if I, I checked the stats just before the presentation, it's roughly three times the state of the size of the state of Texas. So pretty, pretty sizable piece of land. Um, as far as who, who am I? Like Chris said, I've been, been paddling for forever since I had way more hair when I, when I started, um, I was really into whitewater kayaking for for a time, and uh, Tim and I were were talking about that during the the San Juan trip. We have a lot of commonalities of places we visited, but a lot of a lot of California whitewater kayaking out in Idaho and Costa Rica. Um, just last year, I was able to go down the Grand Canyon. That's me rowing and some of the flat water, but I, I kayaked, river kayaked a, a hundred miles of it too. So I still like white water, but I'm I'm just really primarily into into sea kayaking and have been mm, since since about 2000, but really heavily got into it in two, 2010. 
So favorite place to go, Channel Islands. I'm down in Los Angeles, so these are kind of my backyard. That's Anna Kappa. This is another thing. This one's, I think, off Santa Cruz Island I took. Um, I have sea kayaked in other places, too, though, that I worked up in, in Alaska doing marine debris cleanup a few years back. Uh, went to Glacier Bay during as soon as it opened up after after COVID. It's kind of like trying to get a, a touch of Greenland, and it, it was nice, but um, uh, I like Greenland better. Um, Vancouver Island, I've paddled there a few places, and uh, Baja, California, I go there uh, as often as I can. And a uh, common theme, though, even back to the whitewater days, I love expedition paddling. I love camping out of my boat and moving from place to place and setting up a new new camp. That's really the, the part I probably like the most about sea kayaking. And um, because of that, I, I really, really love Greenland. Um, let's see, I'm kind of checking my notes so I don't don't miss anything. So I got interested in Greenland. I studied geology back in, in uh, college and got interested in glaciers and glacial terrain. We obviously have a lot in, here in California, um, but not many and not much in the terms of active glaciers here. Um, and I, for a while, I was working in Europe and kind of commuting back and forth and the, the flight routes. And I'll touch on this a little bit later. But a lot of the flight routes to Northern Europe, you go right over Greenland. And so I'm like pressed to the window of the plane. I, this is one I took out the window of these huge active glaciers, fjords. And it's like, wow, I, I need to learn more about this place. Um, kind of the last straw in, in 2017, my son's a merchant mariner. He works, he's a chief mate on cargo ships. And he spent a I think it worked out to be a couple of weeks in Greenland at uh, uh, Northwestern Greenland. Uh, they were delivering supplies there. So he sent me the, the whole bunch of pictures and that, that was kind of the last draw. I said, I need to get out there. And I tried to get out almost immediately and found out, hey, it, it's really hard to get there. It's really hard to get a spot even on a guided trip. Um, so I'll talk a little little bit about that it took me a while after getting this picture from my son it was well over almost two years before I uh, got out there so um let's see I have been as Chris mentioned been out there twice 2019 um for about uh almost two weeks again last year and I was out there a lot a lot longer than that I've spent about um 44 days paddling uh, i totaled it up and right around 450 nautical miles paddling so I'm, i mean that sounds like a lot but i already showed you how big greenland is and it, this these little colorful lines here that's the extent of what i've paddled so it, you you could spend a lifetime i think paddling paddling this country and not not see everything so it's a little myopic view that I'll be presenting here, the little piece of Greenland I've seen on the, the two two trips. So, you know, take take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, this is a more detailed view of, of the kind of, each one of these represents a, a, a little mini expedition where we'd go out from, let's, to Sealac was a popular, starting point head out here and then maybe stop here and some of the people of the trip might leave and others would would come in so the colored lines are resupply points and actually i misspoke this green one th this one we went all the way over here so it, again just a little snapshot of what there is to see out there and i've spent a lot of it in these fjords a little bit here and the more the open sea conditions that expose to the North Atlantic. So again, I don't purport to be a uh, Greenland expert of, of any sort. I'm just kind of sharing what I've seen and, and done there. Um, so yeah, so that's really who I am and why I like, uh, or uh, what got me into Greenland. And 
Like, why would why would you want to go there? And th this picture kind of says a lot in my my mind that being able to camp in places like this and and have a look at the the ice and they they look all they're called icebergs, right? Which implies they're sitting there like static mountains, but these these are moving all the time. If you take the time to watch, they're they're traveling around. So it it's a very dynamic environment, even if if it doesn't look look it sometimes. Um, I it's got a really interesting history, and I'm I just want to touch a little bit on that because I, the the whole effect of the the Inuit hour on our sport is is pretty enormous. So it's been been populated for like going at least at least a few couple thousand years back but unraveling some of the settlement um there was what the, these inuit precursors that called the dorset um and the also the norse that came in the scandinavians vikings they they kind of were headed this way in at ad 900 um and they they actually started coming in and settling in Greenland by by 1100. And meanwhile, the Thule, who were predecessors to the Inuit, they were they were moving into this area too. So by about 1500, the the Vikings were gone. For um, let's see, 1500 over here, Vikings were gone from Greenland. The Thule slash Inuit, they had. Uh, settled about as far as they were going to go, but you can see even then at the peak of the settlement that there were not a whole lot of population around southeast Greenland, and and it's still that way. It's very very sparsely settled. Um, uh, let's see. But there's the cool thing about this history and the other types of history that I'm going to touch on. A lot of this you can still walk out there touch it and it, so there's the Inuit this is a navigational marker it can be seen from a long way out at sea and they they would use these to help find their way while they were, while they were kayaking or sledding in the winter um there's these turf houses they lived in in the winter months they're all over the place and they're kind of like dug into the earth lined with rock walls and then they would have had whalebone and hides in some cases wood forming roofs over them um they're pretty common out there and they're they tend to be really filled with with green plant material because all the the animal waste like seal bones and such that uh their 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 food waste would just be thrown out the door in the winter so it's still kind of acting as fertilizer even hundreds of years after they left um there's grave sites here and in there it's not not uncommon to find them um there's this we think is you know they do those rope exercises where they're kind of training to roll and doing balancing drills and we we're thinking these are poles and they would have had the rope going between them and done their their training there in their turf house in the background um and that obviously the huge rich history of of kayaking with this this culture so these pictures were taken roughly 100 years ago and there it was a, a family effort building these skin on on frame boats that and there's been been any number of books and talks given on this to topic so i'm not going to get into it in detail but here they were they're using these little windscreens at the front of the boat. Well, it looks like a windscreen. It was more like camouflage. So that to a seal, um, it would look like a floating piece of ice and they would get as close as they could and harpoon or later in later years, shoot the seal. And they have these bladders on the back of the boat that would be attached to the harpoon line to uh, keep the seal buoyant even after it, it uh, died. Um, there's some museums, even in the smaller towns where you can see their original kayak gear and, um, and original boats. So it, it, that's all, even if you didn't go paddling, I think that hopefully a takeaway from the, 
this talk, it's worth going out there and, and seeing these things that actually still there to, to see. Um, let's see where I am. Okay, so that's kind of the, the Inuit history. The Danish came around uh, in, a, in 1721, and it's still a tight uh, relationship between Greenland and, and Denmark. They're, they're an autonomous territory of Denmark is the official term. So there's lots of Danish architecture around. Um, there are churches and such. All th this particular church is a museum now. This is a little harbor at Tasilak, and there's ships, the big red ship here. That's a supply ship full of food and other wares that, that came from Denmark. So they're, they're very much uh, dependent on and cooperating with Denmark to, to this day. Um, Christianity is really the primary faith now. Um, and then I want to touch on the English history, because they, they came in about 100 years ago, and there was, there's multiple books on, on this guy, Gino Watkins, and what he did, but he, he and his buddies were in their 20s, it was after World War I was over, they, they wanted an adventure, and one of the things they they thought of well let's go to Greenland no one knows much about that place and there was actually a justification that British government was interested in funding this because we they were seeing it even let's see it was uh 1930 to 1931 they were seeing Greenland would be an important stopping point for transatlantic flights um also the weather Weather reports from Greenland give a good indication of what, what will happen in Europe a, a couple of days later. So Gino Watkins was funded to have an expedition out there. He worked, bonded, employed uh, uh, some of the, the Inuit in that area. He learned how to kayak. Ultimately, he died kayaking. He, he disappeared on one of his... Uh, one of his outings and his empty kayak was found later, but he probably one of the first expert non-Inuit kayakers that uh, paddled these waters. And they established a base camp. They lived there well over a year. There's a view inside the cabin. So they were doing things like mapping terrain for mapping mountains, um, looking at collecting weather data. And again, there's there's multiple books on this guy you can read. They're just fascinating what they they experienced while they were out there. And we were able last summer on one of our trips. This is the foundation of that cabin we we're just looking at. It's still still out there along with remains of their their camp. And here, I kind of one of my favorite things to do the, then and now. So this was their supply ship in 1930 and it's it's docked in this in this bay or anchored, I guess moored would be the right word. And then I basically found the exact same place, the same island, same glacier behind that the, that that photographer was standing in oh, nine wow. years before. So kind of fun to line that up. The, the glacier has receded somewhat as have most of the glaciers in Greenland, but you, you can tell it's the same place. And there's a lot of things like that you can do in, in, in this remote and almost untouched place. So World War II comes and then there, there's, um, this becomes an important waypoint for uh, the American aircraft that are on their way to Europe to help fight uh, World War II, and then it, it stayed an active air base in a, this particular one into 1947. Um, there's an, any number of military installations in Greenland, uh, U.S. and other, um, but like, like I mentioned, my son visited one that's still active out in the northwest coast, but this particular one was abandoned in the, in the late 40s, so this next picture that's that same hangar, the same mountain, and there's all kinds of uh, wreckage left over from, from the 1940s. So 
just abandoned and in place and the this these are pictures I took. I did they look cooler in black and white, so I tinted them. Um a lot of fuel. <laughs> I took a lot of fuel to fly to Europe, and then these just thousands of empty uh fuel drums were left behind. There there is a cleanup effort that was just started last year to get rid of some of this. Okay, and then today, um Let's see, so it's still very sparsely settled. You'll see young kids around, but the older kids to, to go to school, they they go to the main capital city and of Nook out on the west side of Greenland or even abroad. There's just no higher education in that that southeastern Greenland at all. Um there as with the other indigenous cultures, there's a lot of harm done, but um with the colonization, but they're kind of revitalizing their re respect of, for their past. So this is lady that was working in the cultural museum there and dressed in their uh, traditional clothing, but also going shopping out at the, the local supermarket, but she tolerated a picture. There's still very active boatmen, um, fishermen, Etc. They're the expert water people, so they uh, they're still out there hunting and fishing. Um, even marine mammals is a significant part of their diet. They go bear hunting too. So I didn't see any living polar bears out there, but I've seen a few of them that that were were shot um, and the hide being cured on these drying drying racks. Here's, here's another one. And then they use the bones and whale teeth and others in their in in their art still. So they, they build or create the pretty cool uh, artwork. These are actually like a something you give to, to a person and and it would be bad luck <laughs> to if you received one. It's like trying to wish bad luck on somebody, but they're Pretty cool to, to look at. These are all made out of sperm whale teeth. And they still do dog sledding. It's mainly a tourist kind of activity, but they do use it to some extent in the winter months. So snowmobiles are more popular. Um, they, they keep the sled dogs, they feed them uh, seal meat for the main part. Uh, that's puppy. They're, these are Greenlandic sled dogs. They're, they look like huskies, but they're they're different. They're thicker fur and kind of a heavier body. And that's just a warning sign that <laughs> there's a dog sled crossing on this road. All right. So why else would you want to go there? That just that's a little bit on the history and and culture, but the the scenery is right up there too. Um, so this is paddling up a up a fjord and they're just incredible, incredible scenery there. Um, hiking after, hiking around one of the many camps there, the giant glaciers in the distance and icebergs in the foreground. Um, a surprising number of flowers out there maybe not a huge variety but lots of lots of really pretty flowers if you have to get down close to the ground to get these pictures of plants are only a few inches tall for the most part um and lichen that's kind of the one one of the first uh plant forms of plant life that settles on the rock and breaks it down into soil all right um and there, I the wildlife. Um, oh, let's see, I look just a little more about the scenery. One or two more. The water is surprisingly clear there, and kind of caught me by surprise. And then you get the midnight sun, of course, that everybody hears about. I, the, I probably took this at like two in the morning. Um, let's see. So that wildlife is a big thing out there too, and probably the. So mixed blessing, but these Arctic foxes, they're, it's always a treat to see them. They're, they will steal your food.
food and a, one woman even had one of her booties stolen and never did or no it was a hiking boot and she had to wear her booties the rest of the the trip because so we we had to be really wary about protecting our stuff that from these are smart curious animals and then they'll come right up and whales there's um we saw humpback whales most days that I've been out there, thin whales too. I didn't have any really good pictures of those, but the humpbacks, um, they almost come right up to you. And on one of the, there was one time I was being transported in a, in a motorboat and we saw a sperm whale here he, he was logging on the surface like resting catching his breath and then before he does it huge dive down a thousand two thousand feet deep so that was never saw a sperm whale anywhere um until i went went to greenland all right and the uh, camping that that's probably my my favorite thing <laughs> Here, when could, you're just finding these spots and just doing hikes and and hanging out and checking the view, watching the sun track across the sky and the glaciers drift by. Um, so the great, great campsites. Sometimes you're camping on rock, and so you you need to bring need to bring a good sleeping pad. Uh, four season tents is important. You, the pictures I'm taking here, they're generally in good weather, but you do get strong wind there. You do get rain. And that was one of the, the best spots where the, the icebergs just drifted by all, all night long. Glacier in the background. That's actually the, the Greenland polar ice cap in, in the background. And the food is surprisingly good there. This is actually, this is a supermarket, the Peeler Suisok. It, it might not look like much from the outside, but you go in and, and you can stock up on, on really good food. <laughs> so, I mean, they're just shelves and shelves of stuff, primarily imported from, from Denmark. Um, so... These guys, these these are two German guys I paddled with for a week and a half, and they they brought all their own special food from Germany. It was all packed up, and they maybe bought some cookies now or candy bars now and then. I I on the other hand, I did all my food supplies from from these markets, and every settlement out there has has such a market, so they. It, you really you pay an arm and a leg for the fresh fruit and vegetables, but it's there. And like, I love apples, and that was a good way. Kind of fun going in shopping with an IKEA bag, but uh, it works. Um, so expensive fresh foods, but you can get lots anything you would want to get canned, dried, um, and yeah. Later on, I have a picture of the frozen food. They get a lot of baked goods, like ready to bake breads and pastries, and that they'll they arrive frozen from Denmark, and then they'll bake them fresh in their their ovens. So that kind of a treat to have a real a real Danish Danish in Greenland. Um, fresh bread. I'm kind of a carb guy, so some carb carbohydrate porn here. Good cheese though too, and then the one of the only locally sourced um, foods is these Greenlandic shrimp, which are pretty good. I mean, they're really mild taste. That was some frozen vegetables. That was my my favorite dinner. Kind of saute it up and just eat it, eat it on the rocks. Um, so lot lots of good food to be had. Um, probably if you. In talking to people who make it to Greenland, the main thing they wanted to do was see and paddle um, in with icebergs and looking at glaciers. So that that was again that one of the big reasons I went out there. So I've, I've got a bunch of pictures here that 
along those lines, like dawn and the fog is lifting off the ice. And, um, views from one of the, the little settlements of the glaciers in the distance. Um, think I think this is as good a point to talk about it as any other. The, the, they, they're beautiful and everything, but they're actually one of the main dangers because they're melting constantly and they're shifting their center of mass changes as they melt. So they do roll over and they it could be they could be pretty uh, damaging. There's the 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 waves they cause and the uh, that just if you are hit by the ice. So you do have to stay a little further away from them than maybe you would like. And like you, you'd never paddle, or I'd never paddle through this tempting little ice ice arch. As as nice as that looks, <laughs> a, a buddy took took that picture of me. This is an active glacier coming down into the into the water and calving off. They had a uh, previous trip. I wasn't on it, but they had a camp set up on one of these uh, rock ribs that was facing such a glacier, and they actually had the the glacier calved and tripped off some tsunami waves that flushed several of the boats out into the into the water. So. Um, we we avoided camping at water level any anytime we were near near a calving glacier. Uh, and that's just the view looking through an iceberg at a at a big glacier. And you get these incredible surreal shapes of the ice. You can see the, the little horizontal lines. Those are former water lines where the, the water has melted the ice away and then the glacier rises up as it loses mass. Remember, it's uh, roughly 90% of these uh, icebergs are, are underwater. It's only, we only see the top 10% floating. And just if, if you like the color blue, <laughs> this is a, Great place to go. All right, so that's kind of the the pretty picture part, and then a, a little bit of maybe a little bit of the how or things to think about. It's a a big deal to get there. It takes um, about three days because you have to fly to Iceland. And then the airport that you use, the, their international airport is a, about at least an hour drive from the airport that's used to get back to Greenland or over to Greenland. And it, it's almost impossible to arrange contiguous flights in, in, uh, without spending a night in Iceland. You lose a day getting to Iceland too. So it's a big deal getting there and then there's limited flights. Um, so you, you need to you need to plan well in advance to book your your travel. Um, and the, the airport is on one island, Kulasuk, and the main services are on another island. So you need to shuttle over there either by by boat or by helicopter. Um, there, there's a very narrow little window for paddling. There, there people I know have gone out there in, in mid-June and had to wait a couple of weeks before they could paddle because the, the fjords were all, all still iced up. Um, and if later on by August time, there's this offshore pack ice, that's actually your friend. It's it, kind of like our kelp here on our coast. The offshore pack ice kind of modulates the, the North Atlantic swell so that the open coasts are much more user or paddler friendly in, in July and early August when that, that offshore pack ice is still around. Um, so the, those offshore or open coast trips get more challenging when that's gone. And then by the time September, like right now, it's getting to be pretty late to be paddling there. Um, so it's a, again, a narrow little window. Um, you know, you, you folks all know about cold weather gear, but um, there's some special gear <laughs> you need. And 
in addition, pretty common to have a gun in the in the group. So if you did have a bear issue, then you'd have some a last ditch effort for driving it away. That that's not anyone's first choice, but good to have it on hand. Uh, satellite communications are kind of important, but I I've, I made a note on the cell because more and more they have cell service in these little settlements, so you can get on the internet that wasn't like that way in in 2019 but it is now you you can you can get on the internet or call call internationally talked about the tent um just more it it it's not very warm there despite the nice sunny pictures i took um you, you need some good cold weather gear i mean really cold weather gear and they don't have much in the way of bottled gas although i think that's improving i just brought a multi-fuel stove out each time i've been out and I, I never had trouble getting fuel for it um just i've only been on guided trips before the 20 2020 i was kind of putting together a private trip and lining up rental gear and transportation and then the COVID happened so I didn't do that, and there's less people supporting those kind of trips now than there were back in 2019. It, it might be coming back, but so there's some guided trips available, and I think most of us, or at least some of us, know when you when you go on a guided trip, you're kind of doing things the way the guide wants it done. You're paddling with people you don't know, and that can be a mixed blessing. I made some great friends and some not. <laughs> and but if you're going on your own, it's it's a remote place. It's hard to rent gear. Um, you do need to line up your own emergency support, obviously. So um, there there's some downsides to it for sure, and it, it's hard to get things shipped there. There the Baggage logistics are, are challenging. Um, okay, next chart. So just in, on that topic of challenges, I kind of listed these in, in order of likelihood, not in or maybe not in order of the 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 potential impact if if they occurred. So the biggest danger is far as I was concerned with when you're landing and you need to get through this tidal zone and get your boat up to some place where it's, it's not going to get beat up by the, the waves or whatnot. And there's decent surf or, or tide changes and all this slick, slick uh, seaweed and rubbly footing. So th we did have some injuries with people's uh, twisting ankles or, in one case, breaking a, a, a thumb, falling uh, while, while we were moving the boats around. So that's the biggest thing. I talked about icebergs. Again, they're beautiful, but more dangerous than they, they look. And with the iceberg come the risk of tsunamis. Fog is pretty common out there. So I, I know you guys know how to navigate in fog, and it, it you do want to have a, a compass and and. Uh, and probably a GPS too, because there's a lot of uh, magnetic anomalies in that area that kind of play games with your compass. Campsites, uh, route finding due to the, there's passages you can only do at high tide. Um, uh, the, most of these are, the rest of them are kind of obvious, you know, winds and things breaking. And I put bears at the very bottom. Um, we did do bear watches where somebody was looking over the camp from a high ground um, at, when, at, when we were out in the more remote areas. Um, so we did like two hour shifts on that, but never in, in all those days I've been out there, I've never seen a, a live polar bear. Um, if you did have an emergency, um, the, they they have basic medical care there, but if anything serious, you need to go all the way to Iceland. So you're you're looking at probably a couple of days um, to get get treatment for for something severe. Um, having a satcom 
whether it's at the minimum an inReach or something similar and better yet a satellite phone, that, that, that's pretty important. And lining up somebody who could pick you up with a with a power boat if you have some kind of problem that I think that's pretty critical for any of these trips. So I've got some links here um, and I'm happy to share these via email if anybody wants them. But the guy I've been out with at Martin Rickard, he has a website and um, he does trips all, all summer long. They tend to get booked up well in advance. And, He's he's been going out there over over twenty years. These are all his boats. He has a fleet of MDK boats and and others. Um, so he he, had, he does have good equipment. I I bring my own paddle and um, other basic basic things, all my own camping gear. But he uh, he provides top notch boats and PFDs. Um, Arctic Dream that'd be something like. If you wanted to go out there, they're just starting to delve into doing self-supported support, if that's the right way to put it. They also lead all kinds of boat boat and uh, hiking excursions on, on power boats. So they're a really well-run company. It's a da Danish guy that, that owns an uh, Lars Anker Muller. Um, so I highly recommend that. And one of his spinoffs, Tassilac Tours, that's somebody who used to work for, um, who used to work for Lars and now has his own little business. And there's some good stuff on the web. On the web. This Visit Greenland has a lot of links and maintains like lists of businesses. Um, Martin, Martin wrote up an article that, that's in, uh, Paddler, Paddler Magazine, so that's the link to it. That was part of one of the trips that we did last summer. He he wrote a step-by-step -step, uh, story on that. And then I'm just starting to get into videos and putting some things on YouTube. So I only have a couple up there on Greenland. They're, they're very short, but um, if, if you're interested, there's more there. So... That's what I have in terms of a, my canned presentation. Uh, up to you guys. Uh, any any questions I might be able to help with? Wow, that was great, Carl. Thank you. We got Thanks. we got questions galore here, so <laughs> I'll get started. Um, so Tim asked, did they recommend bear spray instead of guns? I think I know the answer to that one. We. We didn't use it on our trip. I have in Alaska, but it wasn't used or recommended on these trips. They did have noisemakers um, that we we had that you you know make the buzzing, flashing kind of thing. And some people set up little electric fences around their campsite. Um, we didn't have those. We we're it was in our case guns and doing a bear watch. Yeah, I think I've read that um, bear spray isn't either isn't recommended or isn't considered to work for polar bears. Yeah, if, if, if I heard if I heard right, I'm I'm not sure you can import that into oh. Greenland. I know you can't bring a, in a handgun, which if you could, that would make things a lot easier. But it's only the long guns can be used there. Oh, interesting. Um, and so is it a shotgun, I'm guessing, or a rifle or? Um, yeah, either, either or, okay. yeah. Wow. Do they, um, you, you saw the polar bear pelts, do they eat the polar bears or they just? I I think there's some eating of the bear and then some feeding of the meat to their, their dogs. Oh, the dogs. Yeah. Okay. Is that, I mean, are they shooting them kind of for? safety or subsistence or are they um, kind of overshooting them um there's a definite quota in place and paperwork involved in in getting permission to shoot one and then even if there was if there was one shot in self-defense i 
I believe there's a significant amount of, of paperwork involved okay. with that. So it's not willy nilly, but I it's not uncommon though to to see one of those hides in in a settlement. My understanding they tend to shoot them when when the bears come in close to the settlements. Yeah. yeah. Um so Lisa asked, um, your photos are beautiful. What equipment did you carry? <laughs> Ah, uh, thank you. Um, I use a mixture of my my cell phone, just a Motorola cell phone that um, in a in a waterproof bag. I take it out for the for the good photos, and then I have a it's a kind of old Nikon waterproof camera in the a AW one hundred. Oh wait, it's right here. <laughs> uh, yeah, the the AW one hundred here kind of blurred but yeah put it by your face I think but. yeah um so but that's been I haven't brought anything nicer than that out I've seen like the guy who took this picture here I gave him credit and he there's a link to he made a, a little um a little YouTube movie about the the first trip we did together last last early July he had all kinds of camera gear. He had a drone. This that this is taken from a drone. He actually flew the drone through that through that I, I, arch in the iceberg. So that's our group actually in there that he was he was filming. So, but I don't have it. I didn't bring anything that fancy. No, well, your photos um there are even better than this one. So, congratulations. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, somebody else commented, Cindy commented, wonderful photos. Uh, Stuart asked, how often did you get rain? Um, I, uh, thinking about that, it's maybe one out of 10 days. It, it's pretty good weather there. And, and it's my understanding that polar, polar ice cap kind of maintains some high pressure and has a drying effect on the air that, that's coming into East Greenland from the Atlantic. Ah, that's nice. Um, and he also asked, what about mosquitoes? Um, hardly any problems, although that that um that English base camp that we visited, that that they were it was thick with mosquitoes. So we did all have uh, the, those head head meshes that you that you'd wear in Alaska. That's but I only used it in maybe a handful of days and all the all the time out there. And there are mosquitoes, not black flies, or they're mostly mosquitoes. Um yeah, I'm trying to I don't mm -hmm. think there 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 are little flies, but they yeah. don't bite. They just want to like land in yeah. your eyes. And yeah. so those are much more common than the mosquitoes, but there were none of those those horrible biting flies like you'd yeah. find in the Midwest. And... Yeah. Oh, that's handy. Um, so you mentioned a six week trip. Was that a guided that was a guided trip as well? It was it what a it was all guided by Martin or Ricard, but really what it was, it was three of his week and a half long or two week long trips that, and I just, I hung out all summer with him. Uh, it was, it was pretty cool. So the other regular, regular customers would come and go and then we'd kind of hang out together. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like the way to do it. Did you by any chance meet a, uh, did he have a guide that was a Polish woman named Anula? I Probably. don't know that okay. name. There's okay. a Danish woman I met that named Lena. Okay. Um, and she started her own little business out there, but I, I didn't I didn't meet a Polish woman. Um, looking at some of my questions here. Oh, <laughs> I had uh -oh. a question. The grave site that you showed in Canada, there's a there's a place in Canada on the west coast of Vancouver Island that has a grave site that looks like that where it's an open cave kind of a thing. Um, is I wonder if that's similar kind of a custom or was it a, is it your sense that that was a reverential grave site to honor the dead or 
Yeah, I, it's my understanding they were originally the grave sites, they were completely covered so, to protect the remains from those foxes and such. But I think it's some, they're over, over the years, they've been, they've been opened up. I mean, there wasn't any obvious sign of, of the bones being disturbed or tampered with, but they, they, it is common to see them open now. Wow. Yeah, it looks um, it looks inviting, but not for the faint of heart, I would say. Well, I didn't get into it, but one of the, I will now say, <laughs> there was uh, the first trip I went on in 2019, there were two guys from New Zealand, and then they they had done all sorts of paddling in New Zealand, and there's something about the the environment just unnerved them and they ended up quitting the trip that they needed to be carried to their boats taken back to the town and it, it was kind of a big deal and but they just they they weren't enjoying it at all was it too cold for them because i would imagine it's very different than i maybe i i don't know there's a lot going on to where you know you're it's so alien from what we're all used to. And yeah. I don't, I did, w w in general, we thought they were overwhelmed, but maybe it was just, they ran out of energy from the cold. I don't, that was, that's another thing I didn't touch on. One of the guys early uh, on my first trip, he'd been out there before. And he said, if you're, if you're not paddling, you should have something in your hand. You should be eating all all the time because you do really go through a lot of energy so i was eating all the cheese of uh, danish sausage you name it I, all and didn't gain any weight at all yeah it's um i think it's hard for us particularly californians to appreciate um how much energy you can burn up just staying warm that we don't experience on our trips in California, Vancouver Island, Alaska. Those are coastal. They're still, you know, maybe it gets down to 40, maybe, you know, high 30s, but it's a very different situation there where, especially next to icebergs. Yeah, it's like a being next to an open freezer, the, right. the cold air coming. <laughs> and I get, as you're saying that, I'm thinking that's one of the reasons I like the camping there so much. Because here you're setting up this nice little warm environment, yeah. a, a down bag and an air mattress in there. It's it's really nice to get away from that cold for a little bit. Yeah. If you've got enough warm clothing. Yeah. <laughs> so we have another question in the chat. Chris is asking, did you say that the whale tooth carvings were given to wish someone bad luck? That's my understanding. On them, I'll uh, I, I'll dig up a reference and share that with you. They, they, there's a special name for it. Um, I'll, I'll I'll dig that up. It seems yeah. kind of how does one give one of those? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, there, there's a, a whole little story about it, but I I'm not I can't remember now. It's a few okay. years. Since yeah, I'm then. curious. Right. I didn't buy one. My wife said she wouldn't want one in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems, I, I don't know, it seems kind of uh, uncharacteristic of indigenous cultures, which tend to be, you know, more sharing, giving kind of culture. Well, so, and it, there is that aspect too. I mean, they're extremely generous with their food or whatever they they have. So you're you're right. This kind of is at odds with that, but it it, it is part of their their culture. Yeah, we'll have to read up read up about that one. Okay, any other questions from folks while we have Charles with us? I've got some notes here. So in uh, in your long trip, um, I guess to, to, depending on if, so they do kind of standard week and a half trips, like they, we're gonna go here, right? Or do they, 
uh, explore it all and just say, we're going to try this. And if you the, wanna... It's more the latter. And then Martin's been doing this long enough that he, like, he doesn't want to be pinned down <laughs> to anything. So I remember uh, one of the first things I asked him, well, what does the itinerary look like? And he, he just, the British accent, but he, well, it's impossible to say. So oh, that's good. But so there's general goals on where it, and I'm I could go over it on um, just one of the it's way back toward the beginning here. I don't know if you are you do you still have my slideshow up? Yes, it's still okay. showing. Yeah. Okay, I'm going back to there it is. So like one of this green. This green line, this was the first trip out of the last summer. So we did have a definite goal of making out. This is Gino Watkins base camp was out here. And then we also did a hike on the polar polar ice cap, the Greenland ice cap. I, I didn't want to bombard everybody with every photo I have. But like here, we had to we had to spend an extra day because this cape here was all choked up with with ice. And the chunks of ice are a bit, even if they're just basketball size, you get enough of them, they, the wind comes up and they'll crush a boat. Uh -huh. So we had to turn back and spend an extra day here and we finally did make it out there. Then then we had to sprint back up into the, the warmer waters here to make up for that, that lost time. And the goal had been to come all the way around, finish out on a circumnavigation of a, a Moxilic Island um, but then the wind came up, so we we had to stop here and then get a boat ride back to to Sealac so that the people that on that first group could get their flight back out. Yeah. So that's just one. I, I think every one of these trips had something that we planned to do and then we couldn't because of weather, ice, or personnel issues. Does he um, have requirements in terms of paddlers? How does he um, accept paddlers' that was, that's readiness for this? Maybe one of my sore spots, because there were some people out there that I, I think he even admitted, well, why did those New Zealand, I thought they'd be good paddlers. Why else would they have come this far? To, yeah. So he kind of like is relying on people to self vet themselves more than maybe some people do. Um, he, he does, doesn't require people to have a role, which I, I wish he did, but um, and he's expecting, it's kind of well known that you're, you're going to know, have to have your own camping gear set up, camp yourself, paddle it, paddle your boat yourself, not have anybody cooking for you all. So some basic, skills yeah. but nothing advanced in terms of kayaking capabilities and you know that there were people that needed to be towed as a result or even kicked off the the trip so yeah because you could get some pretty advanced conditions i would think in the open crossings and high winds and yes yeah uh so somebody put it in the quote a link to the story behind the greenlandic Tupelac, which is maybe, is that? That was what I wanted to call it, the Tupelac, but then I wasn't sure if I was confusing that with their, their clothing. So yeah, that's it, Tupelac. Okay. Well, people can grab that from the chat there from Kim Patterson. Thank you, Kim. Thank, thank you, Kim. <laughs> Save me some homework. You're welcome. I was curious. Okay. Let me see if there's any other uh, questions here. I think that Oh, why did you choose the east side over the west side? Um, from I heard really good things about Martin Ricard was a big factor, and then just seeing seeing that scenery there and all those fjords and the glaciers coming and the mountains. It's very doesn't show up so well in this particular chart, but it, it's very mountainous and rugged there. So that that's what drew me in. Yeah, and it does look like there's some protected areas there where you're not, you know, in a quite so exposed environment every single day. So right. that's advantage. Great. 
well, I'm tempted. I don't know about anybody else, but uh, <laughs> so um, yeah. So he probably starts taking signups for that pretty early on for the coming years. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I think he's already got a few people signed up for one of his trips next summer. Okay. And is there a month you would? It sounded like July is it, right? Well, he's oh, starting, maybe it's, um, he missed a few years of with the COVID lockdowns and then the, the Greenland was closed to travel even longer. Um, so he's doing longer seasons than he did in the past. He just finished a trip today or yesterday. Oh, okay. So, but that's getting to be where it's really cold. And yeah. Uh, but yeah, July July is probably the best and early August. Yeah, great. Lots of very positive comments here. Fascinating presentation and beautiful photos. Thanks, Stuart, who's an expeditioner. Uh, thank you, Charles. Great presentation of a great adventure. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> lots of very positive comments in here that you can look at later. But. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, so great job, Charles. Thank you so much for sharing that because oh, we don't have too many examples of this one. So I think you may uh, have some customers for Martin coming up here. <laughs> and are you going to go back? I, I really want to. It's a, that, that was part of what I wanted to touch on, all the places I've been. That That's still my favorite. So I'd love to go back. I was thinking of maybe as a goal, maybe do part of it part of the trip with martin and then go off on my own for another couple yeah. of weeks yeah and you you said you got a lot of your own food uh i guess you don't need you don't use bear canisters maybe no. an electric fence but um you were able to get enough food to last for several weeks, even though there's not that many villages around? Um, so back to this this chart here, like Tasilak, that's a settlement, Kulasuk, that's one, that's actually where you fly in. Um, but people have done self-supported trips out of there. They have a great market. Up here, Kumiat, there, that's another settlement. There's yet another one. Oh, I'm sorry, th this is Kumiat here. And then there's another settlement over here, this red dot, and then Tenet over here. So you can, if you look, you see these lines going and yeah. touching on settlements in, in every case. So I was able, always able to resupply with within a week at the most of, uh, of between trip or between yeah. resupply. Right, wow. Very tempting. I'd have to get more cold weather gear, though. I I, I used good... every bit I had. But... Yeah, I bet. I don't. I don't have. I discovered I don't have warm enough kayaking gloves. No, I, I brought my pogies, and I ended up not needing them as much as I thought I would. Actually, mm. it's only when the wind really came up. Mm. Okay. Well, we're getting past time, and I don't want to. I want to be okay. respectful of your time, but. I could talk all night, but thank you so much, okay. Charles. This was great. It's recorded, so um, I'm sure many of us will be reviewing it. All right. Thanks well, thank again. You.